All right. So today in this talk, I'm going to be talking about this particular paper by Turing. It's called um, Intelligent Machinery. It's from 1948. So this is sort of one of the earliest papers in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Turing is particularly interested in answering the question as to whether machines can display intelligent behavior, specifically intelligent behavior that isn't just a reflection of the intelligence of the person who programmed it. So when you write a program normally and it does something clever, well, usually that's just because the programmer told it to do something clever. Whereas really what Turing is interested in answering the question is whether a machine can develop its own intelligent behavior through minimal training. Okay, so to do this, he introduces some simple models, uh, which I'm going to be outlining in the, in the later parts of the talk. And I'm also going to give you a modification of one of those uh, models to use some sort of more modern notions. But really this paper sort of predicts a lot of the sort of early uh, a lot of those sort of fundamental concepts in machine learning now. In particular, uh, the model he gives is based on uh, neurons. So that sort of predates neural networks. And then he also gives a simple version of reinforcement learning, which I'll be going over soon. Okay. So I'll start with the definition. And it's worth pointing out that this definition is somewhat vague. Turing admits this. So we're considering machines built from some kind of standard component. So if a machine which is constructed in a systematic way, we call that organized. Otherwise, if it's constructed largely in a random way, It's called unorganized. So this doesn't pretend to be a precise term, but it sort of matches sort of the idea of a machine that's prior to training you would think of, or a, a neural network prior to training you would call unorganized. And then after it's been training and has its weights set appropriately, then you would call it organized. So the other definition that Turing gives is of two types of modifying a machine. So one of those is called uh, screwdriver modifications, or screwdriver interference. So that is basically taking a machine apart and rebuilding it from scratch to do something different. more precisely, it's changing the architecture of the machine. And then the other type of modification, which Turing focuses on in his paper, is called paper modification, or paper interference. So that's changing the way that a machine behaves by simply supplying it with information. So. So an analogy 
from universal Turing machines would be screwdriver modification is actually changing the, the Turing machine that you're actually computing with. And then paper modification would be taking a universal Turing machine and simply changing it the code that you provide it with so it calculates something else. So this doesn't require actually changing your machine, it just changes how the machine behaves by changing what information you're giving it. Okay. So the idea that Turing is interested in is for a machine to be able to modify itself through supplying it with some simple information or simple feedback on what it's doing right and what it is doing wrong. So. And it's worth emphasizing, I suppose, that we want it to be simple feedback that we're giving it. We don't want it to be giving it complete information on this is the exact output string that we want this machine to output. Because if we give it that, then we may as well just write the program by hand. If we know that information, then there's no need for machine learning in that sense. You could just tell it how to, how to compute that string. What we want is, well, the situation that we're in, though, is we maybe have some fuzzy idea of what things are correct and what things are wrong. For example, in image recognition, most people can recognize objects in a photograph, but we don't really have any idea on how to tell it how to know which ones are dogs, which ones are cats. So we want to be able to give it just simple feedback. Turing, in his paper, just gives binary yes or no answers or rewards and punishments, but uh, I'll argue later that that's a little bit too... Uh, doesn't give enough control. But we want to make sure that it's simple enough that we can actually give the feedback. Okay. And note, by the way, that if, if we could design a machine that could do this, then this would in some sense answer the question that Turing was interested in answering, which is can a machine display intelligent behavior that, we don't, uh, that isn't just reflecting the intelligence of its programmer? And the argument that Turing makes here is that it's very much analogous to how a child would learn through suitable training over many years, right? And it wouldn't be fair to say that the intelligence of the machine is just intelligence of the creator, no more than it would be fair to say that, or to give the parents credit for everything that their child does. That wouldn't really make any sense. So Turing argues that if we can get a machine to modify itself or to teach itself, then really it's the machine that's being intelligent, not the creator. Okay. So let's move on to A-type machines, which is the first model, which is based on neurons that Turing outlines in his paper. So. So Turing describes it as the simple, simplest possible model he came up with of a, of a nervous system. And it's basically a machine which is built from a network of nodes, which are essentially time-synchronized NAND gates. So a node uh, has two states at a given time. It has two inputs, two input terminals. And it updates according to the following rule. So let's call the inputs A and B. Let's call the node N. Then N of T plus 1 is equal to 1 minus AT BT. So that's essentially the NAND of A and B. Where by AT I mean the state of A at time T. And obviously for N, state of time T plus 1. Okay, so let's formalize this definition. Oh, I also didn't say an A-type machine is just a network of these nodes that I've described. Okay. <coughs> so 
So it's a finite set of nodes. It's a subset which we call the input nodes. Yeah, I suppose the point of these examples that Turing gives is to show that in principle you could train a machine by providing it with appropriate feedback. But, uh, I mean, he finds himself in the paper that the example he gives, which I won't go into too much detail later, which are called p-type machines, he finds that the results that he gets are actually not terribly promising because the fact that he can only give a yes or no answer is, is too, too restrictive, basically. Uh, the comment I thought you were about to make here, though, is when I say a subset I have input nodes. I'm not saying that anything in here can only be one of these. Like, AT and BT don't have to be an I. I'm simply saying that they're inputs to a particular. So these are basically the way that you would supply the, the machine with init its initial state. But nodes can have any other nodes as their input terminals. <laughs> it's a bit sort of a clash of... Definitions. Okay. A non empty set uh, O of output nodes. An initial state. which basically specifies the initial state, 0 or 1, of all of the non-input nodes. And lastly, a function that tells you how to actually wire the thing together. So the way to think of this function is basically every single one of the nodes except for the input nodes. So the, the input nodes you just say at the beginning when you run the machine, I want this one to have state 0, this one to have state 1, etc. All the other nodes are fixed by this function here. So their initial state is given by this function here. And they update according to this rule where the, the two nodes A and B that are their inputs are given by this function here. So every single non-input node has two inputs, and it's these two nodes here. Okay. So let's just draw a quick example. So if you check here, every single node has exactly two inputs. It can have one or more outputs because there's no, there's no restriction on using multiple, a node for multiple outputs. Um, according to this definition, the subset i here is actually empty, right? Because every single node has two, two nodes that have incoming edges. Oh, it has two incoming edges, and so therefore there aren't any that have zero incoming edges, which is what it would mean for a node to, have, uh, to be in the set i. OK, and then. The update rules would be the following. So 
the inputs to B are E and C, so that's going to be 1 minus CT ET, uh, CT plus 1. Well, the inputs to C are D and E, so it's going to be 1 minus DT ET, D, T plus 1. The inputs to D are D and C, so that's going to be 1 minus CT DT, and then E, T plus 1. The inputs to E are E and B, so that's 1 minus B, T, E, T. Okay. So, so far in this formal definition, though, I haven't specified how the state updates, so let me just quickly write that. So a state is just the information of which nodes are 0 and which nodes are 1. It's just a function which goes from nodes to 0, 1. Time evolution of the states. It's just a sequence of states. Oh, sorry. The time evolution on a given input, so on So what is the input? It's just a specification on what the input nodes are initially. So the initial state is given by, if we're inside the set of input nodes, it's given by H. And if we're not inside the set of input nodes, then it's given by the thing that's fixed in the definition of the machine, S in it. And then the way that the state evolves over time is given by the following. Uh, again, if we're in the input nodes, well, that, that's just fixed. It's always going to be HX. And otherwise, we do this, this NAND. So it's 1 minus ST I1. X, uh, S, T, I, 2, X, where I1 and I2 are the projections onto the first and second components of I. Any questions? Okay. So, this is a sort of simple, as I said, it's a simple model of a uh, neuron, or a system of neurons, a network of neurons, but it's not clear how you would actually train this by providing it feedback, right? Because it seems like the only thing you could really do is just tune the weight, the, tune the, the values of the input nodes and the, or the or S in it by hand. And that doesn't seem a priori any easier than just writing the program by hand. So Turing then moves on to define B-type machines where it's at least a little bit clearer how you would potentially train it. Okay. So 
So he defines this thing called a B-type connection, which is basically a small collection of A-type nodes. It looks like this. So it's worth quickly saying something here that technically this isn't actually what Turing does because the way that Turing does it doesn't have this extra node here but for reasons that are not really very important to the talk it turns out that the resulting class of machines you get out of that are not actually computationally very powerful. They're essentially equivalent to just a network of OR gates and OR gates you can't compute, well there's lots of Boolean functions you cannot compute using only OR gates so that's why this extra node actually fixes that problem. Okay, and then an eight, a B-type machine. Yeah, you can imagine this, this, the input here is some other node that I haven't drawn, and it, we've just got two arrows coming out of that node going into this one. So a B-type machine, is the is a machine obtained by replacing every edge in an A-type machine. by one of these connections. So in particular, every B-type machine is an A-type machine, but the reverse is definitely not true. Because it's, if you just construct an A-type machine at random, it's very unlikely that you would get something that, where every edge happened to be something that looked like that form. Okay. Uh, let me also just say, I'll mark this node X and this node Y, and we call X and Y the weight nodes. So it turns out that the behavior of a B-type connection is actually determined by the weight nodes. And the way to see this is as follows. So notice, first of all, that let's say the initial states of X and Y are equal. Well then, we have the following. Where again by that I mean one minus yt. So to see that, so suppose for example that they were both zero at the, at the initial state. Well then, in the next time step, the inputs of x are both 0, and it takes not that, so it becomes 1. And then similarly for y, the inputs to y are both 0, so that takes not that and becomes 1. And then on the next time step, we just do the opposite. They're both 1. You take 1 and 1, that gives you 1, and then you take not that, that becomes 0. So basically these two things will just keep alternating between 0 and 1, and they're always equal for all t. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in the, in the, in the notes, uh, I say that if x0 equals y0, then yt equals y0 for all t. That should be x0 does not equal y0. And then similarly, uh, 
So in the notes, this one is equals and this one is not equals, but it should be the other way around. Okay. Well then, returning to this diagram, we can discuss what the behavior of a B-type connection is, assuming we know what the states of these two things are. So let's say that the input to this thing is some node A. Well then, the state of this at the same time as this is AT will be not AT minus 1, right? Why? Because it, remember, it takes, the pre it takes the values of A from the previous time step and takes NAND that. Well, we've just got the same input twice, so that's just taking not the thing at the previous time step. This one, if this is at YT, well then again here, you take NAND this and this from the previous time step, so the, the value of this node at, time, at the same time is going to be uh, A T minus 2, not that, because that's the value of that thing, NANDed with this thing at the previous time step. Okay, but if you simplify that, that's equal to a t minus 2 or uh, y t minus 1 naught, just by De Morgan laws, which is equal to... Mm -hmm. If you start with one zero, then the inputs to this are not zero and zero, which is not zero, which is one. So it stays as one. No, it's the same thing the other way around. Yeah. Oh, right, thank you. Yeah, that, that is. Yeah, the point, the point of this one is basically it just keeps alternating between what it was initially and the other thing. <coughs> so then, what is this? It's going to be AT if YT minus 1 is 0. No, sorry, if yt minus 1 is 1. And then it's going to be 1 if yt minus 1 is 0. But then that, in turn, is the following. Compo composing with this thing that we figured out here. So it's going to be 1 if x0 is 1 and y0 is 0. It's going to be a t minus 2 if x0 is 1 and y0 Sorry, x0 is 0 and y0 is 1. And it's going to alternate between the two if uh, x0 equals y0. But the two more interesting cases are these two. So basically, the point of this is, depending on the value of these weight nodes, we can get this to act just as a normal A-type connection. Well, ignoring the fact that there's a slight time delay, right, because you have to pass through more nodes for this thing to work. So you're two, t you're two time steps behind just a regular A type, A, A type machine. But ignoring that, you can get it to just act the same way as an A type connection, or you can override its input and just give it the constant signal one, depending on the value of these weight nodes. So this thing essentially acts as a switch, and it's this that Turing has the idea of training. So you could imagine supplying these things with appropriate inputs to change the behavior of the machine quite drastically. It does somewhat suffer from the same problem, though, in that it's not 100% clear how you would do this other than just by hand. So the next point that Turing moves on to in his paper is to sort of think, is to think about how exactly he wants to be providing feedback to the machine. And the idea that he comes up with is, as I mentioned before, called p-type machines, in which he provides, he, he watches the output of the machine. Oh, actually no, let me be more precise. So 
the machine has some parts of its description that are fixed and some parts of its description which are initially randomly decide, decided and then, he, and then the machine is tentatively making the same choice every single time it gets to the same state. And if the person who's training the machine looks at the output and thinks that the output is satisfactory, then it can give the machine a reward or a pleasure signal. And in that case, the machine takes all of its tentative choices and it fixes them. So it just locks, it, locks them all in place, makes them permanent. Otherwise, if the operator does not like the, the output of the machine, uh, he can give the machine a pain signal. And then that causes all the tentative choices to be discarded and then randomly reassigned. Now, Turing gives a simple example in the paper of such a machine, but the difficulty First. is that the operator, the person who's giving the training, really just does not have enough control over what, what the machine is learning from each of its signals, right? Because every single time it receives a pleasure signal, it locks every single choice, even if some of them may have been wrong, it locks them all in place. And so there's really just not enough control that the person who's trying to train the machine has. So, at this point, I'm going to sort of diverge from the paper slightly and I'm going to give a sort of more modern treatment of how you train a B-type machine by using sort of a greater degree of control in the, in the feedback of the machine in that you can give it a real number for each of its outputs rather than just a yes, this output is good or no, this output is bad. uncertainty in what it's doing, right? And one way to model that is to simply say that the, the values of the nodes inside the machine are uncertain, and that's exactly the same as their probability distribution, right? And it's 
testing it always. And in case tables one, looks somewhat similar. So it's once again hx if uh, x is in y. And otherwise, it's this function. Delta, delta and the man is the function that makes the following diagram here. This is the free vector space on basis zero one.
And then you can verify that that thing is in fact a probability distribution from the fact that those two things get a probability distribution. Is that Yes. Uh, okay. So, suppose teacher. Oh, I guess I should fix my beat up machine for this. So, Yes. 
So we're just choosing some new real numbers such that uh, they have this property, and there are multiple choices. There are multiple choices you can actually make for the A W naught or A W one. Doesn't really matter. Just as long as it satisfies this property, it's fine. function, it's the expected value of C over all possible output strings with respect to the particular distribution we have as our output at this time. Note, this is a function of P, but P is also a function of the weight vector A, because it depends on what the initial weights were. It's the, and the, yeah, the distribution that you have at time T is going to depend on what the initial weights were, so indirectly it is, uh, L is a function Some time, 
you decide to give feedback. So after t time steps, you decide to give feedback. And then that causes you to adjust the weights. You would then recompute p for the same time step, and then you adjust the weights again, and then that's on. So you would apply this rule multiple times for a given reinforcement. And just to unpack what this formula is saying. how you would update the individual components of the vector in the case where n equals 1. Can I ask you about the definition of capital L of P? Mm -hmm. uh, so if I'm to interpret this as the expected value of C over all possible output strings x, mm -hmm. then I need a probability distribution on the output string x. And here mm -hmm. it's assumed that this factors into P1, x1, up to Pn, xn. Is, is that an explicit assumption that you're making? It's not, it's not, it's not a, I mean, this is not the actual Bayesian probability of that output string. It's the right. Okay. We're just defining a particular way of propagating the uncertainty. I mean, if, if you actually made a graphical model out of the P-type network, you'd end up with a factor distribution. You assume that all the, all the output things are initially independent. Mm. You end up with this. But of course, that's not, that's not the real problem. Right, okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you took the real probability, that would be sort of not quite a chewing head in mind because he has not like a local update rule. Mm -hmm. uh, the real probability that maintains huge joint distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see. Change that also. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a little bit confused about P is not a function of T. So is the idea that we fix some point T and then we fix some initial weights and then run the machine? Yeah, T, T is the time where you gave your signal. So you let the machine run by itself for a little while, it updated yeah. its distributions accordingly, and then eventually at time t you decide, I want to give you some feedback now so you can adjust your weight. Yeah, so the t comes first, but like, we're, we're making the decision to run the machine up to some fixed point t and run the weight's performance up to that point t, which you find that we run it. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, you can do it from 2t next time. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you need, you need to keep showing sure. sure. yeah. and some p on a. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Then you'll want to write LFP as a function of time as well, right? Oh, sure. Yeah. I suppose that uh, you think about whatever you want the machine to learn as being learned if this doesn't change anymore. But if you have this gauge freedom in the A's, where essentially A says all the A's can be shifted by the same amount that you don't change the probabilities, yeah. then there's no guarantee that using this rule you will get a fixed point for the A's. Only for the No, points. but I suppose that doesn't matter so much because the thing we're actually interested in is a fixed point for the distributions, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, the purpose for actually doing this reparameterization is if you don't, then your update rule is not going to guarantee that you land inside, you get a probability of distribution out. I was just curious what was the learning rate L that uh, that's just some real number, right? And I think you want to make it as small as possible so you can apply this update for multiple times per... I mean, what you really want to say is take that gradient vector from the flow of it. Yeah. You want to discretize and do that in a series of discrete oh, steps. Yeah, so you want to make it to be some small number so that you can apply it multiple times and you're following the surface more faithfully. Right. Yeah. So gradient descent was already introduced by Turing as a way of updating this machine? No, Turing didn't, Turing did not introduce this. Okay, okay. 
So um, Turing, yeah, Turing, at the, at the point where this basically diverged from what Turing was doing was when I introduced the probability, the probabilistic version. So Turing oh, describes, in his paper at that point, p-type machines, which I mentioned, which don't work, and Turing sort of is aware that they don't work. He, he, he gives an example where he changes the machine's behavior, but the problem, problem is it just changes it and then fixes it. In. The moment you give a, a pleasure signal, it just fixes everything in place, and so therefore you're never getting any different behavior ever again, which is kind of problematic. And one way you could fix that, I suppose, would be to give more frequent signals to the machine, so you're only locking a couple of bits in place each time. But then that runs back into the problem that you're essentially just writing the program one bit at a time by random sampling, and so it's sort of that's not really any better than just writing a program. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the signals are too infrequent, you're essentially just hoping by random chance you stumble onto the correct answer and then lock it all in place. So that's not good. And if the signals are too frequent, then you're just writing one minute at a time, so that's not really any good either. And I think Turing in the paper also says that he would be, he would be interested to try to do a version of training B-type machines as well. I don't know if it would be exactly like this, but it had something to do with tuning the weights in some principal way. But he, he found it too difficult or too laborious to actually do by hand, which is essentially all he had available to him in 1948. Any more questions?